enjoy the session today. OK, thank you. I'll, I'll hand it over to you, Rob, unless, Mark, you have anything that you wanted to nope. say as well. No, nope, okay. that's good. Thank you. Great. Sure. Yeah, I'll just um, share my screen. Sorry, hang on here. Are you able to see my slides? Yeah. OK, perfect. Oops. Perfect. OK. Uh, OK, so um, hi, everybody. Um, as Jillian mentioned, I'm Rob Terrio uh, from Georgian College. And um, just by way of uh, background, um, I've actually been in the paramedic field. I've been a paramedic for over 35 years and been teaching paramedics for about 20 years. And um, uh, I did a master's in educational technology. And at that time, um, I developed an interest in virtual mixed and augmented reality. and got to experience uh, virtual reality for the first time at a conference in Washington, D.C. a few years back. And um, it was uh, it was a paramedic educator conference and someone was wearing a VR headset and uh, I could see what he was seeing on a big TV screen. And quite frankly, initially it was really unimpressive, uh, just like like any animated scenario I'd seen in the past. Um, when I put the headset on, however, it was quite um, an incredible, I mean, it was a wow experience for me. I was standing in front of a patient who was struggling to breathe and I could hear him struggling to breathe. And I felt like I was in the room with him. Um, what, what they, in virtual reality, they refer to as a sense of presence. And when I spoke to him, he was able to answer in using four to five words at a time before taking a breath and i was able to take a stethoscope and listen to his chest i was able to hook up a monitor and look at his ecg and his blood pressure and his heart rate and his respiratory rate and so on and i could also walk over to his night table and pick up his medications to see what he was taking and um two things really struck me at the end of that experience one um was that I actually got the same similar twinge of adrenaline in that virtual reality experience that I get in the field when I encounter someone who's really sick and I think I need to assess and treat this person quickly before they um, deteriorate. And two, um, I started thinking about my first year paramedic students uh, who, who, you know, with whom we, we do some case-based learning in the first semester and really um, sort of intensify that case-based learning approach in second, third, and fourth semester. Uh, but in the first semester, they really uh, have no context. Uh, I can talk about cases, how people might present when they're seriously injured or ill, but um, and I might show some images, but they really don't have context. And it struck me that immersive virtual reality really gave them context. They could feel like they're in that place, whether it be on the side of a highway with traffic rushing by or trying to care for someone who's seriously injured or um, in a house or in a club or in a down a, an embankment at 3 a.m. in the morning trying to run run a resuscitation in sub-zero temperatures um, in the dark. Um, now granted, um, I'm not sure how they mimic um, sub-zero temperatures in virtual reality yet, but I'm sure, I'm sure that's coming. Um, so uh, I decided uh, I, I I wanted um, to introduce virtual reality into uh, our paramedic program. So um, uh, as you know, colleges and universities typically um, have no money, no money, no money until suddenly there's a bunch of money and it's got to be spent right away. So I've always had fresh quotes ready for things that I wanted um, in terms of simulation equipment or other things. And I had some money ready for some um, computer equipment and virtual reality software. And um, when the time came, uh, I actually got the funding for it, uh, which was a bit of a surprise actually at that time. And um, I introduced uh, mass casualty incident triage in our paramedic lab. So it was a piece of software where the student uh, would don a VR headset and would, um, would go to a, um, uh, there was a bus that drove into a hotel lobby killing some people injuring some others so the student would have to go to each individual person and and triage them determine whether they were uh, dead or you know had minor injuries or serious injuries or critical injuries and need to be transported immediately or could be delayed and um, 
after that, I uh, I started exploring some other VR applications and then uh, held a, a demo in our lab, uh, which was quite successful. We had uh, quite a few uh, nurses and physicians from surrounding hospitals come. And that led to um, a call from our president who asked me if I would meet with her and the vice president academic to tell them where I thought virtual reality might be going in education. So I uh, had a nice little meeting, lasted about an hour. And uh, of course, um, every college university um, technology is sort of approached in a similar fashion that um, you don't um, dedicate a lot of money or human resources to a technology until it reaches a threshold level of interest. I tried to make the case that uh, in order for it to reach a threshold level of interest, it needed some funding. And um, to my surprise, a week later, uh, the vice president academic called me up and said, we're going to post a position and we'd like you to apply for it. And so I did. So uh, I've been on a, a secondment now for a year and a half as the immersive technology lead um, for Georgian. And um, it's they've given me pretty much free reign to do what I want, which has been great, kind of miraculous, actually. Um, and if you've been in the University or College System for a long time, you, you, you know that's pretty miraculous. So um, one of the things that's truly interesting and compelling about immersive virtual reality, and uh, I won't talk about augmented reality, uh, but I may touch on mixed reality, uh, and certainly um, feel free to ask questions later uh, about those other areas because they are interesting, but um, immersive VR is what we've been focusing on. But what's, what's particularly compelling about this technology is it can be used as a learning medium um, in all three domains. Um, which is unusual. And as you know, teaching in the affective note domain is particularly challenging. Um, and I'm going to focus primarily on the cognitive psychomotor domains to, to describe some of the pilots we've been doing. Um, but uh, we're looking at using virtual reality uh, this fall, uh, maybe doing some research on using it for uh, cultural debiasing. And I can talk about that. So um, one of the nice things about being at a community college uh, in contrast with the university, is we're we're not bound by the same um, um, level of obligation to produce research, and so that gives us a little bit of freedom. And um, I've been able to to launch a whole bunch of pilots, um, and I think <laughs> people have asked me, you know, how did you how did you uh, launch all these pilots? And I think it's because I'm a paramedic and. Um, uh, I'm really impatient. Uh, I like to get things done quickly and I like to see immediate results. Um, uh, that's that's sort of the nature of dealing with life and death in the field. <laughs> and so maybe that's maybe that's why I've been able to get so many pilots launched. But um, I'll just tell you, uh, we've had virtual reality in our architectural technology program for over four years. It's fully integrated into curriculum. And um, so there are lots of different reasons to think think about or lots of different benefits to virtual reality. You know, one is um, a spatial experience, being able to, you know, design a building uh, in 2D on a screen and then actually be able to step inside the building um, as a student. And that gives you a, a different perspective. And from that perspective, you might look at the ceiling and think, oh, the ceiling needs to be elevated two feet or this hallway is more narrow than I thought it was. We need to widen it a bit. Um, I remember reading a story a while back, and I wish I had a, a link to the article, but it was a story about some architects who, and, and this is very big in architecture now, uh, virtual and augmented reality, some architects who designed a children's hospital. And what they did was they, sh they shrunk their avatars down to the size of a five-year-old and walked through the hospital rooms and were able to design the rooms that, uh, in a way that was more child-friendly uh, because of that spatial perspective. Um, the first pilot project that, that I was able to launch uh, was with our Indigenous Studies program. I was um, attending an event in a, on a platform called Altspace VR, which is a Microsoft product. It's a it's a free social VR platform where you meet with other people and you can build worlds. And I went to a language learning um, session just for fun. And it, it struck me that uh, context was kind of important for language learning. I'm not a language instructor, but uh, we have uh, in our digital studies program, um, we have four language courses. The first course is called Language in the Home. And I thought, uh, 
wouldn't it be cool if those students could actually be inside a home? Um, so I built a home for them in Altspace VR, and we subsequently built another house. We contracted a company to build another house in um, on a platform called Engage VR. And so the students meet here every Thursday. They go inside the house. They have conversations in the kitchen. All of the objects in the house, the bedrooms, the garage, the, uh, the living room, um, the bathroom, are labeled with the Anishinaabe Moin word and the English word. And the students can just click on an info button to get those uh, translations. The house we built in um, Engage VR, um, there are little um, um, audio buttons on everything in and outside the house. And when you click on them, you actually hear the audio file of the pronunciation of the Anishinaabe Moin word, uh, which is very cool. And in the other world in Engage VR, you're actually able to, able to pick up objects. Um, so, excuse me, we know there's some evidence to support uh, context based learning as a way to help with language retention. And when you make it interactive, that raises the level of uh, retention as well. So um, the students had synchronous classes on a video platform like this. They also met every Thursday um, in virtual reality and, and they, we actually went from pilot to full integration into their program uh, within the space of a semester. The students loved it so much, um, not just for the learning experience, but for the social experience uh, because between classes they could come into this world and they could have um, conversations and uh, the Indigenous Studies faculty also invited elders in to speak. There's a fire pit um, uh, off on this. This house is on a big piece of land, so the nice thing is you can build land and home as big or as small as you want. And so the el this elder comes in and, and uh, does prayer and talks with the students. Um, interesting thing, uh, she's uh, the the elder who meets with the student. She's 84 years old and she'd never used a computer before and completely embraced the idea. They showed her how to use the laptop. They also gave her a virtual reality headset and she has three different avatars, one in Altspace VR, one in Verbella, which is more of a 2D platform, and another one in Engage VR and meets with the students regularly and <laughs> absolutely loves it. Uh, it's really quite incredible. Um, so the um, uh, Jeremy Balenson, who is the founding director of the Virtual Human Interaction Lab at Stanford, uh, wrote a book called Experience on Demand, in, in which he says that um, when you think about immersive virtual reality, think about uh, reasons to use it uh, where learning might otherwise in, in, an, in an analog world be dangerous, impossible, counterproductive, or expensive. Um, and you can add a whole bunch of other things like difficult and and so on. But um, here's an example of, of where uh, a colleague and I met in a volcano. Um, you might get close to a volcano in real life. You're not likely to get inside a volcano in real life <laughs> for reasons you might well imagine. Uh, and this is quite incredible. We could actually walk through the lava and the physics uh, of this volcano were, were pretty good. Uh, I'm not a volcanist, so I, I couldn't tell you how precise they were, but um, uh, really quite an amazing experience. So again, a good example of uh, context based learning. Um, here's another one where this is me in a spacesuit uh, at the International Space Station and uh, there are two worlds, one where you can explore the exterior of the International Space Station, one where you can explore the interior and the interior is um, not so much 3D, but when you, if you're going through the different passageways, it, it, uh, it looks like an image. Uh, of all of the panels and it's um, it's a, a replica of uh, the inside of this, the space station. So uh, pretty amazing experience. And um, this is another one still which is um, speaks not just to context. This is a SARS-CoV-2, the virus, right, that causes COVID-19 and not just speaks to context, but also um, uh, the concept of infinite scalability where um, he, the, the, the professor who uses this for his classes, took the SARS-CoV-2 and enlarged it to the size of a small planet. And he and uh, his students can walk around this virus and grab proteins and examine them close up. And there's all sorts of information placards around the virus. And um, uh, 
Uh, so this concept of infinite scalability is really intriguing, uh, you know, where you can look at a virus in this kind of perspective. Uh, there's a product called Nanome, uh, which is used by scientists and uh, pharmacologists from around the world to examine novel viruses, to develop new uh, medications, um, including there was some research done on the mRNA vaccines uh, with uh, collaborating scientists from around the world inside Nano. So it's a social VR platform, but where you can take molecules uh, and look down to, at the at, uh, atomic level um, and, and have them, you know, the size of a, a bowling ball or, or larger to be able to see um, details, which is quite interesting. Um, from a skills perspective, um, you know, one of the really important things in virtual reality is that that the student has agency, that they're actually able to do things with their hands. Uh, and there's not a great deal of research uh, around immersive virtual reality and, and immersive vir virtual reality has really only become a viable and affordable uh, education platform uh, since around 2016. Um, and um, there's lots of research from before that, but it's usually based on 2D screens. And um, so not a great deal of research. So if you're a researcher, there's lots of low hanging fruit here. Uh, but but what's uh, really interesting about agency, being able to do things with your hands is that um, you, in virtual reality, you can conceivably repeat those procedures uh, more often if you've got a VR headset at home than you might be able to in say a lab. There was a, the one on the right here is um, um, a surgical application from a company called Also VR, and they did a small um, study. It's very small, so I don't know what you can take from it, but but uh, they had 20 second year medical students, uh, and they split them in half, and they randomized uh, randomized them to standard training for a basic uh, surgical procedure, which is an orthopedic procedure where they they had to drill into the tibia and put a pin into the tibia. So they, they had standard training, which was a combination of text, lecture, and video. And uh, another group uh, uh, was randomized to immersive virtual reality. And they found the percentage of steps done correctly in VR versus standard was 63% versus 25%. And uh, the, the student's ability to retain the information about the instruments uh, and the procedure was 50% versus 11%. Uh, so again, a small study. Uh, but uh, uh, quite compelling. The one on the left there is uh, from a company called Ubisim, which is a Montreal company, and they have uh, nursing simulation scenarios, but lots of nursing skills as well. So if you were going to, for example, um, administer insulin to a patient, um, as a student, you would go into the stock room and get all the necessary supplies. So things from, you know, hand sanitizers and gloves and sharps containers and the appropriate size syringe, and, and you go into the, the the cooler to get um, the insulin and so on, and then you'd walk out to the bedside and assemble everything, including doing things like hand washing techniques. And uh, you can wash your hands at the sink and actually times you so that you wash your hands for uh, 20 seconds, which is really cool. Um, so skills are really important in, in VR, lots of potential there. Hang on a second here. Um, our veterinary technician students uh, we're doing animal dissection and animal anatomy in virtual reality. This is a product called Victory XR. And um, so, uh, you know, because of COVID, obviously it was uh, difficult, if not impossible, to get them into the lab to be able to do animal dissections. And finding enough cats to dissect or mice or frogs and so on and so forth is always a challenge and expensive. And so in virtual reality, they can do it um, with um, the person you're looking at, Wendy there, the instructor. Um, uh, I don't know this lady, but she's part of their product. She's an instructor and she gives them a tutorial on how to, how to do the dissection. So uh, there's another table on the left that's not visible in this slide, but um, you can pick up forceps and scalpel and you're given instructions on where to make incisions and, and you can take out organs and, and look at them. Uh, it's really quite amazing. Um, I would say the downside to this product is it doesn't have analytics. That's a serious problem. So um, the, the faculty have no way of knowing how many times the students did dissections, which animals they dissected. 
uh, whether they dissected them in the right sequence or appropriately, um, un unless they assign them a reflection paper or some sort of test after the event. Uh, so that's a bit of a shortcoming. Um, to add analytics to this program would also add to the cost, and that's typically a cost per student per year. With this product, it was just a, a straight up cost, and, and the product is ours for, for good. So we're still exploring other options for our veterinary technician students. Um, they, they were looking at uh, VR anatomy for canine and bovine anatomy and virtual reality, uh, a product that we got there was an uh, open education resource from uh, Virginia Tech University, and so we just took the uh, the file for it, and uh, one of the students in our game development program made some modifications to it to make it uh, sort of more Georgian college friendly. Uh, it was very cool. Our um, advanced care paramedic students are have been, have been doing um, pediatric assessment in virtual reality for the past semester, and this fall, uh, they're going to be doing advanced cardiac life support. This is a, an interesting product. It's from a company called Health Scholar. So um, I've been we've been purchasing off the shelf products. We haven't been developing our own and some colleges and universities will develop their own and then pilot it and then maybe do some research around it. Uh, we just I've looked for products that were off the shelf that to me seemed quite compelling. This was one of them and it's an interesting one because uh, although the student has no agency, they're not able to do things with their hands. This product uses voice recognition and artificial intelligence, and each avatar has a, a name tag. And so the student stands there uh, looking at a patient who's sick or injured, lying on the floor, um, and uh, they speak to the avatars and tell them what to do. So they might say, Aaron, can you check for a pulse? Phil, can you start chest compressions? Uh, Fatima, can you start an intravenous line? Ross, can you give a milligram of epinephrine intravenously? <coughs> Excuse me. And um, this product does have analytics, so it gives both the student and the faculty uh, feedback at the end about what the student did and what sequence they did, did it in, if they gave the right drug or the right dose or the right route um, to the right patient and so on. And um, uh, so this can be used for either formative or, or summative uh, evaluation. So it's very cool. There's um, there's an ER physician by the name of um, Tim Cobalt that I met in virtual reality. So avatar to avatar at, a, at an event and we started chatting and he was using uh, Health Scholars uh, Advanced Cardiac Life Support for his ER physicians, his residents. Uh, he's in charge of uh, their simulation lab at his trauma hospital. And so he was talking about doing a randomized control trial with his residents, and uh, we decided we're uh, probably going to look at this fall, uh, maybe maybe the winter, doing um, an RCT where we'll randomize paramedic students to either lab only training uh, versus lab supplemented by virtual reality to see if there's a difference in performance to trying to get uh, both a little bit of quantitative and qualitative uh, data uh, from that experience. Our uh, biotech degree uh, students are um, a handful of them are studying anatomy in virtual reality, and this is uh, again kind of a spatial experience where you're in a life sciences lab with your teacher and you've got this anatom anatomical structure in front of you that's the same height as you uh, and you can walk around it. You can pull muscles off, look at the insertion points, pull bones off, and when you click on muscles, bones, nerves, vessels, it uh, tells you what they are. Uh, you can disassemble a skeleton and reassemble it. Um, uh, so we're really excited about that. So it's being used in our biotech degree, in our nursing degree, and uh, there are a few other programs that are really itching to try it as well. We're also doing uh, chemistry in virtual reality as well in our uh, biotech degree. Our events management students are uh, learning to create and organize events in on social VR platforms. This is um, Altspace VR, the Microsoft product I mentioned earlier. And what's what's amazing about the sense of presence you get in VR is that even though we're in avatar form, you're looking at someone, you're making eye contact, you're gesticulating with your hands, and you feel like you're with them, unlike a video conference. Uh, so for example, right now, I'm talking with you, but I don't see your faces. <laughs> and all, all I see is a little box at the bottom of my screen that says GD and the option to mute myself or hang up or uh, activate my video or something. 
um, or deactivate my video. Uh, but in uh, social VR platforms, you feel like you're actually with people, uh, and that's an incredible social experience. Um, and I think has a lot of potential for um, students to be able to meet between classes, to be able to work on projects together, to get to know one another in a pandemic situation, uh, just to socialize and address some of their, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs issues like. Um, you know, finding out from other students that they're not the only one who doesn't understand the assignment and uh, things like that. So um, I've been teaching online for many years and I've uh, since 2007, I, I've been using a combination of asynchronous and synchronous online learning. And of course, everyone was thrown into synchronous online learning <laughs> this year with the pandemic. Uh, but social VR is probably the next step. Um, so very cool. Um, the uh, three of the students uh, helped with a virtual art exhibit um, as part of their event management program, which is very cool. And our tourism students are uh, creating tours in virtual reality using 360 degree videos and uh, just exploring other tours in virtual reality. Uh, this is not something we're using, but this is a physics lab in Engage VR uh, where you can launch a cannonball to try to sink that ship. And it gives you the distance of the ship, and you can actually do a mathematical calculation, as you can see here. Um, I tried sinking the ship with cannonballs just by um, altering the trajectory without doing any math, and um, uh, I must have launched about 40 cannonballs, uh, all of them unsuccessful. And finally, I did the math and, <laughs> and managed to sink the ship. So uh, apparently, math is important. Um, so we have um, we have close to we have we actually have over 200 VR headsets now, and just over 100 are deployed for distance learning. Uh, so we took a bit of a gamble. We um, you know I met with faculty. Uh, I really my approach has been to to speak with faculty rather than associate deans and deans um, to see if there's any early adopters, anyone who's enthusiastic about exploring virtual reality, and and then we go to the associate deans and deans. Um, to see about um, launching these pilots. And uh, we we just shipped headsets to students' homes. We've gotten most of them back now. Um, we have an arrangement where they, they can't get their final grades unless they turn the headset back in. So that's uh, that stick has been fairly effective. Um, and we have a VR lab in our library, but I'm building three new VR labs um, at three of our satellite campuses. I'll uh, talk a little bit about those. So, you know, um, you might ask you know why VR for distance learning versus VR labs. Um, so VR uh, for um, for distance learning uh, would make sense if you could use VR for the entire semester, like for language learning or for anatomy learning. Um, animal dissection might not be that suitable for VR for distance learning. That's a, one of the lessons we've learned. Um, it'd be particularly value if it replaced a textbook and uh, VR for anatomy is one example that uh, we're looking at. Um, I've been talking with the senior management team of the registrar about allowing students to. Uh, so we have 5000 students who take anatomy every year. And allowing them to choose between uh, face to face. Well, face to face isn't an option this semester, but eventually uh, they can choose between face to face or they can choose online, which would be traditional asynchronous synchronous, or they can choose uh, immersive virtual, in which case they would get a VR headset. And if they do go the VR route, they would not need to purchase a textbook or they could get just an open education resource textbook like from Rice University or something. Um, uh, VR for distance learning uh, might be appropriate for enhancing multiple skills acquisition, for contact based learning, for role playing, especially you know in the social sciences and policing and things of that nature. For VR labs, one um, th this would be VR uh, software that requires a connection to a gaming computer. Most of the VR experiences we use uh, work on a standalone VR headset, but if you required something, uh, a piece of software that was more uh, higher end and required a gaming computer, that would be more suitable to a VR lab. Um, short VR experiences might be more appropriate for labs. So for example, we have um, we have a flight services course where people learn how to become flight attendants, and um, it, it makes sense to put uh, to learn safety procedures in an aircraft in a VR lab rather than having them do that at home because 
there are only so many times you can practice uh, opening the exit doors and uh, and launching um, um, a lifeboat and so on and so forth on an airplane uh, before you've you know pretty much got it down pat. Um, if you've got um, you know multiple VR programs that the multiple students from different programs need access to, a VR lab would be more suitable. And uh, of course, labs give access to students and staff. In our nursing lab uh, uh, at one of our satellite campuses, uh, students are using two products. One is called SimX, which is patient simulation. Um, and it's great in a couple of ways. It, uh, so a couple of students will do a scenario at a time. Uh, a moderator who's the instructor will be on a laptop computer and the students have agency, so they're able to apply blood pressure cuff, a pulse oximeter, put on ECG leads. They're also able to talk to the patient and um, the moderator uses, uh, has a list of pre-recorded responses. So the, the moderator chooses those pre-recorded responses so that the student feels like she or he is actually interacting with the patient. Uh, sometimes there's an anxious husband uh, walking in the background and they have to talk to him. They can initiate treatments. Uh, they can uh, call uh, an emerge or call a physician to get orders. Um, so, for example, there's an anaphylactic case where where they call uh, pick up the phone. So you actually pick up the, the phone and you you say uh, you get switchboard on the line. You say uh, I need to uh, patch through to a physician. They connect you to a physician. You give a full report and then the doctor gives you orders and you put down the phone and you drop epinephrine and you give it intramuscularly and, and the patient starts to improve. <laughs> it's really it's really quite incredible. Um, uh, our trade students, so we have a trades campus in Midland and uh, our trade students starting this fall are going to be uh, using six virtual reality products. One of them is training at heights where they will learn how to don um, uh, safety gear. So, you know, a harness and um, they'll be walking along scaffolding and they'll learn where to clip on the, uh, the, the, the harnesses so that they're secure and if in the event that they fall, they're, they're not going to fall uh, uh, very far. Um, and we're really interested in wor working with the regulatory bodies here. Well, we will, we will be working with the regulatory bodies here to see if they'll accept virtual reality training um, as as equivalent uh, because as you might imagine it's very difficult if not impossible to get students placed uh, on tall buildings to practice safety procedures using a harness now they do have physical harnesses at the college and they'll practice with those as well but this would be uh, um, an experience to supplement their uh, their their training um, we're uh, we actually received a grant uh, to develop um, some virtual reality training for our power engineering students at, at our Owen Sound campus. And we'll be uh, working with uh, seven other colleges uh, and a company called Up360 to develop this experience. And so pretty excited about that. Uh, these uh, power engineering students operate uh, boiler plants. Don't ask me anything about boiler plants, but this is what they do. So um, some, some of our future plans, um, uh, I'm trying to persuade our uh, pre-service fire program to explore and, and we haven't been able to uh, do demos with this because of COVID, but um, I'm hoping as soon as the border restrictions loosen a little bit that we can get across the US or they can come across here to look at this uh, fire suppression virtual reality experience uh, that you see on the top left. Um, so that, that uh, tank that you see uh, on her back is actually a computer and the nozzle that you see the hose is actually a virtual reality um, controller and uh, that's an old version the one they have now is is quite heavy so it mimics the weight of an actual hose and the the pre-service fire student would actually wear turnout gear and the turnout gear uh, uh, heats to up to 100 degrees Fahrenheit as the student gets closer to the flames and they're able to fight a whole host of different uh, fires from um, high rise fires, kitchen fires, um, jet fuel fires, uh, electric vehicle fires and so on. Uh, really quite incredible. So I'm excited about uh, exploring that. The, the image on the right there. So I approached our fine arts uh, faculty about 
uh, sculpting and painting in virtual reality. There's a product called Tilt Brush VR, which is, has now become open source. And there's another one now uh, that's, that's uh, been, that's a modification of it called Multi Brush, where a student and faculty can be in the same space. And, and it enables them to paint and, and sculpt in a 3D environment, uh, which is interesting for a few different reasons. One, because it's uh, just an extension of their art training, uh, but two, it, it potentially gives them a, uh, marketable skills uh, that they would be able to sell to virtual reality companies or uh, other companies. They can also um, create something in 3D and then print it using a 3D printer um, at the end. But um, when I approached our fine arts uh, faculty, they were just a little too overwhelmed with having to move to an online environment. Um, so um, I'm going to speak with them again probably in the fall. The image on the bottom left you're looking at is a product called Equal Reality. And um, there's been some interesting um, psychology research around this, particularly out of Stanford University, where um, um, you experience something called body transfer. So when you look in the mirror in virtual reality and you see yourself as someone else, uh, for example, a person of color, within about four minutes, you start to adopt that, um, that uh, self-image uh, of yourself. They call that the Proteus effect, where where uh, you begin to feel like you're that person. Um, and uh, when you experience um, cultural microaggressions in virtual reality, uh, the potential is to change perspective uh, and to change perception around uh, what it's like to be um, a minority who's subjected to, uh, you know, racial bias. And um, so we haven't done anything, uh, any work in that area yet, but um, to me, that just seems far more compelling uh, than having a discussion around race in the classroom, uh, or at least to supplement that experience. Um, so I'm uh, pretty excited about that. The bottom left there is uh, a ship, and um, uh, we're going to be, uh, this fall, I'm hoping, uh, we're going to be doing some photogrammetry, which is uh, involves taking multiple photos of something and creating a 3D version of it and allowing students to go into there. So uh, we have a, a marine engineering program and students get placed on these big ships and they have to learn how to operate the engine room. Um, now it's difficult to get time on these ships. And so what we're going to do is we're going to replicate, uh, do a 3D replica of the engine room and make it interactive so the students can become familiar with the engine room or engine rooms of different ships um, on their own uh, so that they're fairly fluent with, with the skills by the time they get onto the ship and make the most of it. Um, so um, generally, <laughs> I don't like to do the TED type of thing, but but generally my uh, my call to action to educators <laughs> um, when it comes to immersive reality, uh, uh, virtual reality is one to uh, to explore it because I, th I think it's important for us to uh, begin to understand what what VR is like, what what working and learning in that 3D environment is like. Is it truly experiential learning? Um, is it um, you know spatial learning? Uh, and um, uh, how powerful is the context based learning experience? Um, two, I think that's important because uh, it's important for educators to communicate with companies what our pedagogical needs are. Um, and I've spoken with a lot of companies and just give just to give you a sense of how nascent this technology is. Um, I've spoken with patient simulation companies uh, where they um, when you want to ask the patient questions or initiate treatments, you choose from drop down lists. And that's just not real world. Um, we don't have multiple choices in, in life and death situations. So um, many of them are moving towards voice recognition, artificial intelligence, uh, or they're shifting from um, you know, choosing from a drug to actually typing in the drug name or choosing from a drug dosage from you know, one milligram, five milligrams, six milligrams, or two, 10 milligrams, just actually typing in the dose, uh, which is a, a, a a more effective evaluation of the students uh, learning. And um, uh, I recommend, you know, piloting it, starting small, evaluating it uh, using some informal surveys with faculty and students. Um, and then certainly there's there's a lot of low hanging fruit when it comes to research, which is really exciting. Uh, and then, um, you know, consider integration 
Um, the one of the most difficult parts of integration is you have to have at least a, two or three faculty within a program who are enthusiastic about it, uh, because if you get one instructor who loves it um, and implements it and then they leave to go to another school and the remaining faculty have no interest in it, then it, it dies, right? So um, it's, it's a technology that's a little more expensive than most. And so uh, these are some of the, the considerations. Uh, okay, I'm going to stop sharing my screen here. Well, if anyone has questions, um, please ask them of, uh, of Rob. Uh, I'll just say that was the most thorough overview. Um, and some of the examples you you provided thank were you. astonishing. So yeah, thank you so much for that. But uh, yeah, let's see if there's any questions. Looks like John has a question. John yeah. Johnson from the Faculty of Environment, uh, Earth Sciences. Oops. Faculty of Science, Earth, yeah, yes. Earth and Environmental right. Science. I'm a geologist. Thank you, Rob. You uh, you inspire us in the right direction. I followed your work. It's wonderful Thank to you. connect with you. We've uh, dabbled a bit with Google Expedition and now trying the pro version right now, but haven't had the funding and the justification to go further. As you know, it's difficult. Um, uh, two kind of questions I have after meddling with uh, quite a bit of it. Yeah, is is the role of VR to prepare students and not replace the field experiences during the training? So that's one part. So that's yeah. Are you prepping or replacing? Because everybody says, oh, if you're replacing, oh no, you can't do that. There's so many experiences. And then the second part is, have you tried virtual experiences? while in the field to actually enhance it while you're physically there? Mm. Oh, yeah, your second question is really interesting. So to answer your first question, I think it's I think it's prepping. Um, I, I don't think we're going to get to replacing anytime soon, um, but that's a good segue to your second question about enhancing experience in the real world um, mm -hmm. in the sense that um, well, augmented reality might be the better tool for enhancing the experience in the real world where where, you know, immersive virtual reality is like, um, you know, I think it, do you remember uh, Lucy from uh, the Chronicles of Narnia where she and her brothers and sisters walk through this this enchanted wardrobe and they come out the back end of it and they end up in this whole new world. That's VR to me, right? You, yeah. you look up, you look down, you look sideways, you're in a completely different world. Whereas um, if you were out in the field and had AR glasses, you're seeing the real world with a little bit of uh, digital stuff layered on top. And, um, you know, probably the concept of digital assistant will be the will be the, the biggest uh, application for augmented reality. Um, and AR might be suitable for the field. But mixed reality, I wouldn't dismiss mixed reality. It's, it's, it's a really compelling uh, technology where, for example, um, you know, one of the best examples I can think of is there's a company, a Canadian company actually, um, called Sirius Labs, I think. Um, and uh, uh, again, I'm gonna get the terminology wrong, but, but um, you know, when you, if you want to train in a in a crane or in one of those those boxes that are mounted on those trucks, they elevate you up to the hydro lines. Um, they they provide the box or the cabinet or the cabin, <coughs> excuse me, and uh, you're wearing VR glasses, so you feel like you're on the crane or in this box. Uh, but the levers in the box that you're operating are identical to the ones on a crane or in the box. And um, so that's a, a real, a true mixed reality experience. And um, uh, yeah, so uh, you've got the tactile component uh, with the visual stimulation and, and that's really powerful. You know, when I think of something like, um, um, you know, there's a, there's a VR experience called Nefertiri's Tomb and you can walk through these, the tomb and your VR uh, controller is like a torch and you can hold the torch up to the walls to see what's on the walls, but there's no tactile experience. You, know, you can't feel anything, uh, but that'll come with haptic gloves and so on and so forth. So, so I think, um, yeah, the first part of your question uh, is prep, and the second part of your question, I think, is um, let's see what happens in the next 10 years. Well, thank you. That context, too, that you mentioned, I hope to experiment in geology of geologic mapping. We take them to the fields, very valuable, 
But if mm. you're in the field, can you pull in data and get that size of a mountain and look at your data you're collecting with your little instrument right there? And it's all bridged in. So I, yeah, thanks. Thanks for your answer. Yeah, I'm not sure that technology that VR technology exists right yet, but but mm -hmm. uh, it's it's you know it'll be created or you know can be created if you can get some grant money and work with a company to develop it for you. Tell them exactly what you need. Okay. That would be pretty exciting. Great, thank you. The other thing I would just add to that uh, uh, is that um, I'm a big fan of. Um, open education resources and um, VR is very, very expensive to develop. So a small VR experience might cost as little as 75,000. A typical one is more in the range of 150 to $300,000. And so, you know, if universities and colleges can harness the talents of their game and XR development students or get grants to develop stuff and make it open source available for other schools. That's pretty exciting. So our uh, the homes that we built for our Indigenous Studies program, we're, we're planning on making that open source for other Indigenous Studies um, programs across the country, <coughs> just as an example. And um, I mean, for language learning in general, by the way, I put a link to my slides in the chat there. <coughs> and there's some links within the slides. Um, but uh, you know, just for language learning in general, there's uh, you, you know, it'd be nice to have worlds where there's a, there's an airport and a hotel and a cafe and you know, a bunch of places you could take your your students to to to, to learn. I've got a, a question, if I may. Um, you, you know, when you started by talking about uh, using this in paramedic training. And uh, I can certainly see how you know it gets you into the situation, and you have to figure out what to do, um, sort of intellectually. Does it also help students affectively? Because I assume there must be some—I don't know if training is the right word—but um, uh, acclimatization to, yeah. you know, what can be pretty awful stuff that they're looking at. Does it does it help them with that? Yeah. So that's a really great question, uh, and. Um, one of the incredibly cool things about virtual reality technology is some of the more advanced VR headsets um, come with uh, inward facing cameras like like uh, the Toby cameras. Um, so you can do eye tracking and pupillometry and you can add galvanic skin sensors to that and the VR headsets will will take pulses. Uh, eventually they'll measure uh, facial expressions and be able to gauge sort of uh, uh, emotional reactions to things. Um, so I think the potential to uh, quanti quantify a student's stress level and actually scaffold their learning in such a way uh, in policing, fire, paramedic, nursing, and so on and so forth, scaffold their experience so that we build in stress resilience. Uh, that's really exciting to me because we have no way of doing that now in labs or in hospital. Um, so I talked about a mass casualty incident training and I just kind of threw it in there with our second year students. I didn't dare let our first year students go in it because I wasn't sure how it would affect them seeing dead bodies and people you know, with arterial bleeding. Um, I wasn't even sure how it would affect my second year students. <laughs> you know, I mean, I looked at it and I thought, oh, this is pretty cool. Um, uh, and some students would probably look at it and go, well, it's a little cartoonish but, and it's fun. And other students might be completely freaked out by it. Um, so yeah, I think the biometrics is is a really is really going to be interesting for quantifying uh, not just stress level, but even cognitive load and um, and be able to scaffold their learning uh, that way. Um, but uh, you know, um, evaluating uh, students in the affective domain is interesting too. It's like I mentioned, our nursing students are using SimX and there's two nursing students and a teacher and uh, there's analytics that keeps track of everything the student nurses did uh, and the time in which the sequence in which they did and everything. But what it doesn't track is um, how they spoke with the patient. Were they compassionate? Were they empathetic? Um, but the, the because there's a moderator as part of that experience and it's a multiplayer experience, the moderator can uh, like either record the entire event or just make notes on the side about, you know, the nursing student acknowledged the the anxious husband in the room and provided them both with some reassurance and 
Um, so there's, uh, you know, the, in the same way they would do in the lab or in the field. But I, mm -hmm. I just thought that was really interesting where a single player experience from home um, this, the faculty might not be able to see how that student interacted with the avatars. Right, right. Thank you. Other other questions? Other questions? Uh, I have a question, but uh, I'll, I'll just see if anyone give, give others an opportunity. Lynn, Lynn has a question. Hi, I was just curious as to what your experience has been, Rob, with the proportion of students who, um, like, do you find the vast majority of students that you use these with are able to use the technology and don't have significant barriers related to um, cognitive load or cyber sickness? Yeah, this the uh, good question. The cyber sickness is an interesting one in particular because, um, so for example, the, the, our Indigenous study students who are, uh, they're using a social VR platform as are our event management students. Um, if you're sitting in a swivel chair like I'm doing right now and you're wearing a VR headset and your avatar, if you're using a thumbstick, a joystick to move your avatar, your avatar is moving, but your body isn't, <laughs> right? That, that conflict uh, with the vestibular system, your inner ear um, gives some people motion sickness. Uh, so that's a definite problem. Um, the the alternative is that the students can come in using their PC. So that's a consideration as well. If you're looking at a virtual reality experience, uh, is there an alternative like a PC alternative or tablet alternative? And for our indigenous studies, they have both. I, we have one student who um, she she used the VR headset. Uh, she got a little nauseated from it. She said she loved the feeling of being with her classmates so much that she was going to work through it and she did work through it. Uh, some people do acclimate um, and there are some tricks to avoid motion sickness. Um, the, you know, the way you move in a virtual world and so on and so forth. And I give the students a list of how to do that and I meet with them as well. Um, so yeah, cyber sickness is a real concern and how we're going to get past that piece. I'm not entirely sure, but there's um, Apparently you can get sensors on your ankles and they connect with your VR headset. So if you're sitting in a swivel chair, but you're actually moving your legs like you're walking, um, then you end up walking in virtual reality and <laughs> you avoid cyber sickness that way. Uh, so I think we're gonna, you know, cyber sickness in VR used to be a problem with uh, uh, video latency and, and you know, just um, um, uh, technology that, processors that weren't fast enough. We've, we've gotten past that hurdle, um, but now we still have to get past the other hurdle. The, there was another part of your question. Uh, I oh, think just it was cognitive discussion. load. If, oh, was, cognitive load. Just cut. If you know how you find the cognitive load impacts students, Did, like it sounds like there's a lot going on in some of these scenarios, right? So yeah. do you find that um, that it's overwhelming or? Um, not so far, but that's a great question uh, that I can't I'm not really qualified to answer at this point. We use, we try to keep um, VR experiences short to um, 20 minutes to 30 minutes. Um, some students eventually start spending two, three hours in there at a time. Um, but in but um, you know once we start looking at uh, training for in the trades and other places, it'll be really interesting to see um, a, a, a what point the students you know reach kind of their max. Um, not just in terms of you know, comfort with the headset, but in terms of learning more importantly. Um, and uh, with biometrics, we'll actually be able to measure that or, or uh, you know, at least a proxy of cognitive load, which is really fascinating, I think. Um, the dark side to biometrics is the privacy concerns, uh, especially since one of the one of the best VR products on the market is a is a Facebook headset in you know, the Oculus yeah. Quest 2 and um, when you go to their enterprise version, they assure you that they uh, they guarantee uh, privacy and security. Uh, but you know, do you trust Facebook? <laughs> it's hard to say. Good question. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's all very interesting. I haven't been following what you're doing at Georgian, but I certainly will now. It all sounds very interesting. So. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, we only have a couple minutes left, so I'm wondering if I could um, ask a closing question. Uh, I, I think your more situated and more um, 
you have more expertise than anyone I've spoken to respond to this question. So my question is this, where are we going to be in 20 years with all of this? Well, I'm going to be in a virtual reality headset in my nursing home. That's where I'm going to be. I don't know about you guys. But <laughs> my, my grandfather used to listen to shortwave radios, but I'll be in VR for sure. I'll be yeah. in the fantasy world. I'll be in the Oasis. <laughs> maybe, maybe just one uh, yeah. uh, quick, quick question um, and comment as well. I'm just really impressed with the breadth of the pilots that you're doing in different fields and disciplines. It, it, and that's really this immersive technology is it, it applies to so many different um, areas. And uh, and that would be a, a next step for instructors here is really getting um, familiar with what's happening in the industry and fields. Mm. Um, but I wanted to ask, uh, so you, your knowledge of the different tools was very impressive as well. And uh, I, I wondered if you encountered a, an enterprise system. Uh, so my, my our first look at enterprise systems is that they're maybe a little new to, for an institution to commit to. Um, mm -hmm. And is that your impression as well? And so the strategy you've taken is to sort of align with the specific use case and try a specific tool on a smaller level. Yeah. Well, I think if you if you build virtual reality labs, you can afford uh, an enterprise version of a headset more easily. Um, you know, we went with a commercial version of the Oculus Quest 2 for distance learning just because it was the only thing that was affordable. Uh, but for labs, it, you know, there's the Vive Focus 3, there's uh, the Vive Pro uh, 2, I think it's called, there's the Pico Neo 3, there's the um, Oculus Quest for Enterprise. They're, they're all definitely affordable. The the other piece that, that uh, can be challenging from a um, financial standpoint is the the mobile device management systems, which is the uh, system that allows you to manage software on the VR headsets from a distance. Um, and the MDM with a Vive is free. The MDM with a Quest is $180 USD per headset per year. And I told Facebook Oculus, like it's it's a deal breaker. Like it will we'll just never adopt an enterprise version at that cost. So um, yeah, cost is definitely a factor and I'm be happy to help you out, uh, give you some, you know, tell you what I know about those things. Uh, but just quickly to get back to Mark's question, uh, I'll just say, you know, headsets are going to become more advanced. They're going to become lighter. They're going to become easier to use. Um, you know, people talk about the spectrum where where there's augmented reality, mixed reality, uh, virtual reality. I, 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 I'm not a believer in in the sort of a spectrum. I think it's hard to say where the technology is going to land in the next few years, but I think um, just the dark side of augmented reality is that in the next 10 years, I think uh, most people are going to have AR glasses or contact lenses and they'll be virtually indistinguishable from regular um, lenses and they'll be prescription AR glasses and students will have access to every imaginable piece of information in the world from their um, from their glasses or their contact lenses and we'll really have to rethink how we do um, summative evaluations with students like at colleges at you know, there's a lot of multiple choice tests and multiple choice would just be a waste of time. Even short answer will likely be a waste of time. Um, I think, you know, um, master's level where you're doing, you know, repeated assignments and papers, that's probably going to be a wiser approach to gauge students learning given given that the, there's also going to be an equity issue, you know. Um, you know, it's not fair because the guy sitting next to me has a better pair of augmented reality glasses uh, than me. So it's going to be interesting. Oh, you're 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 muted. Uh, thank thank you, uh, thank you so much, Rob. This was really exceptional, and uh, and coming in on your holidays as well to uh, share this with you with with us. Uh, we're very excited about the future, and and hope to Pleasure. stay in touch with you. Yeah, yeah, happy to help out. Yeah, thank you so much, Rob. Okay. Okay. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks again.